Um, I'm here to talk with you uh, about provisionalization techniques to not only simplify the restorative process for our restorative colleagues, um, but also to optimize the aesthetic outcome. As I begin, I will not necessarily show a step-by-step -step approach. I hope to show you some historical cases to show you where I'm coming from in regards to provisionalization. Uh, and then towards the end, hopefully still have time to, to share with you some really simple step-by-step -step approaches to, to provisionalize either on immediate basis or a delayed basis implants to, to gain the optimal aesthetic outcome. I come to you from Houston where uh, we are sorry that uh, the Astros didn't make it too far, but I'm, I'm from New Hampshire, so last night was a pretty special night in regards to the Red Sox uh, taking the World Series again, so a little light in the mood a little bit here. We are all um, extremely fortunate to be practicing uh, implant dentistry today where we have such great technological advances um, in guidance, uh, growth factors, piezo surgery. Uh, but today I'm certainly going to concentrate more on provisional loading of dental implants uh, and, and to the term coined by Alan Rosenfeld, collaborative accountability, this whole idea of working with our restorative colleagues and with the patients to fully understand where we're headed uh, towards a final treatment outcome um, through guided treatment planning. I'm not going to have time, nor is the uh, topic today guided surgery. Harold will comment on that today, but we're going to try to keep it mostly uh, focused on the provisional restoration. Dental implantology is, is certainly the standard to replace single, multiple, or all missing teeth. Uh, I think today, for periodontist, we have a special opportunity to grab a hold of the, uh, the, the portion of treatment that involves working with the peri-implant tissues to optimize the aesthetic outcome. Uh, we need to set ourselves apart. If you look at the demographics on where we're headed with dental implants, uh, we need to be the premier uh, provider of, of, of aesthetic outcomes and functional outcomes for implants. So I think we have a unique opportunity to, to kind of be the leaders in, in working with, with tissue transitions from an implant platform through these tissues uh, and, and set it up for our restorative colleagues so they can have an optimal outcome. I took a special interest in this uh, nine years ago and, and have continued to implement this into my own practice and, and, and it truly, uh, I feel, has, has enabled me to, to do things that I couldn't do otherwise as far as rebuilding tissues uh, because of this provisional restoration. But we certainly, we all have in mind goals of function and aesthetics. Uh, and my belief is that with a carefully planned occlusal scheme and using an implant supported provisional restoration, we're going to optimize our clinical success and optimize the outcome for our patients. Um, we know well that, that science has given us the ability to achieve osseointegration uh, and, and maintain bone levels uh, at the junction of, in this case, uh, uh, the rough smooth border. Um, in other cases, uh, actually, the very exciting topic that we all hear about either platform switching or medialization of the uh, connection uh, is, is showing us over time that we can do things uh, beyond what we used to expect of bone loss to the first thread. So the, the science and the predictability is there. What we're going to be focusing on today is the peri-implant tissues and how we can protect those tissues from change over time uh, so that we don't end up with that subsequent recession that can destroy an aesthetic outcome in the aesthetic zone. Certainly, I don't want to leave out all the things that feed into this type of treatment planning process, but we do need to focus uh, on the implant supported restoration. But as you see those cases, I, I, there was a lot more that went into this it, between guided diagnosis and treatment, uh, what type of loading protocol was going to be selected. Um, the technology at the other end of it to be able to custom mill uh, abutments, either titanium or, or ceramic um, with, with that technology um, and taking into consideration the design of the implant itself and the abutment. We want to start with a diagnostic wax up. You know, this is something I think that some of our restorative colleagues have, have gotten away from. In a single two situation, we, we just don't need to do that anymore. Well, I couldn't um, stress more the importance of this as a roadmap as we get started on this journey uh, of implant reconstructive, be it a full arch case or a single tooth case. Um, you know, this can be our roadmap to success. It can allow us to create scanning appliances. Uh, surgical guides that are going to be necessary to end up with these implants in the proper position. 
we certainly want to never forget our anatomical landmarks and, and really what we expect uh, in, in the alveolar ridge in certain locations of the mouth is, is difficult. We're challenged by this from the very beginning. So we need to take this into consideration to help us select the proper diagnostic tools uh, to plan for success. Our classic literature in, in uh, Wheeler's Dental Anatomy, we need to start thinking about the cervical dimensions of teeth uh, at the imp implant platform level as it transitions through the tissue. And there's just a whole bunch of information in the literature to guide us on this as we start to think about constructing a, a well-contoured provisional restoration in hopes of creating something that looks like a tooth. Uh, and really thinking about this beforehand, that we're, when we take a tooth out, we would like to place something that, that mimics uh, what we're removing instead of ending up with, with ridge lap situations or overly contoured facial, facial profiles of implant supported restorations. And, you know, as I mentioned, guidance in itself can allow us very simply uh, instead of old, more complicated prosthetic treatment planning, we can pre-plan with guidance looking at our scan appliance and simply sit down with the restorative colleague and make slight adjustments so that we end up with a situation that we're all comfortable with in advance prior to going to surgery. This isn't just in the single tooth situation, as Harold will, will discuss. Uh, it, it is strongly applicable in the full arch cases, probably even more so in regards to uh, determining path of draw of multiple fixtures to support immediate load prosthesis. And this is what, you know, we, we would like to know in advance before we sit down for uh, extraction and immediate implant placement. We'd like to know where the alveolar housing in reference to that tooth. In this case, a tooth that's been orthodontically uprighted has the apical portions outside the alveolar housing. And, you know, we need to know these things in advance of treatment. Another strong example of, of root resorption that on a periapical x-ray doesn't have the power of this three-dimensional image, that there's really a non-existent root or bone in that location, and it's not a case that we're going to be jumping in to place an immediate implant. Again, to avoid the, so to say, um, interoperative surprise or uh, compromised outcome that sometimes we can't recover from other than starting over again. Uh, just a few, show a few cases of, you know, what we're trying to avoid uh, as we go through. When we have two implants here, number nine has failed, number eight it has a one and a half millimeter uh, tissue depth with no running room to develop a, uh, a restoration. Uh, you know, with pre-planning, we can avoid outcomes like this. You know, this example certainly, certainly is a testament to integration, but it, it's something that, that we can't avoid today. With good planning, these things just should not happen. Uh, fairly easy correction with an angled abutment here, but this shouldn't happen. Another case that, uh, you know, a powerful attorney has something like this occur. Uh, it can be trouble for all of us as implant surgeons today. Uh, a case like this where the porcelain works looks quite nice, but as you reflect the lip, because this implant was placed slightly facially, subsequent gingival recession has occurred, and this will indeed be a case that's hard to recover from. Another example of just planning uh, deficiencies, leaving an implant that is non-restorable. And this is a great quote that I often uh, repeat in my memory. Is, it's not necessarily that we're failing uh, or planning to fail, it's that we're failing to plan. Uh, and with all the advances in, in guidance today, uh, we're blessed with being able to really feel comfortable and confident before we lay our hands to the patient. You know, again, we'll, we'll briefly touch on this, uh, the three-dimensional positioning of what we understand from, from literature uh, on tooth position and, and measurements uh, to the alve facial alveolar crest, um, tooth dimensions and cross-section at the cervical level. Uh, and then what we can expect subsequently by placing implants, either adjacent to teeth or uh, adjacent to each other. Uh, we've got some, some good basis in the literature to rely upon uh, in planning these cases. Uh, we need to respect biologic width around implants and what's going to subsequently occur to the connective tissue attachment around implants. What is the uh, realistic uh, dimension between the sulcus of an implant and the connective tissue attachment be it around the abutment or, or the implant itself. 
and certainly what we're going to expect not just at one year but how about five and ten years most of this most of us that are doing clinical dentistry uh, plan to be doing it for a long long time uh, and we need to be thinking about our outcomes not at just at the three and six month mark but uh, decades or two down the road. The classic literature on, on what happens to soft tissue in the interpapillary area is something that we all know. Uh, well, probably one of the most cited pieces of literature that exists is something that we're, you know, we need to constantly remind ourselves on these relationships, especially when it comes to uh, adjacent implants. And I think putting this into mind too, that it's not just mesial and distally. We've got to be thinking about this circumferentially around the entire fixture. And the old adage of six millimeters of bone were good for a four millimeter fixture um, isn't necessarily so comforting. You know, with one millimeter bone on the facial profile uh, of a titanium structure, um, after looking at many CAT scans years after placement, very seldomly do we still have that, that bone there. Uh, and we're fortunate that, that we get away with that many times. But if we can pre-plan and make sure that we build enough uh, buccal alveolar structure, we're going to protect ourselves protect ourselves towards a more successful long-term result. And just another example again of what happens post-operatively uh, after abutment connection. Um, historically, we, we, we are taught and, and know we, we want to expect one bone loss to the first thread. I, I think this is going to be somewhat of a paradigm shift as we'll see in the upcoming years that by changing the implant design, we can probably limit this in certain patients. Uh, finite analysis of restorative materials. This is the next level. If the periodontist is going to be in charge of, uh, of provisionalization, uh, we need to truly understand all the different things that are stacked upon each other uh, and, and consider these things not just for the provisional stage of it, but help the restorative colleague understand the, the different selections they have available to them in regards to abutment design, uh, screw retained versus cement retained. Uh, dimensions of materials that are going to be built into this reconstructive process so that ultimately we end up with something that truly looks like a tooth and mimics the tooth supports the tissues properly uh, so that the long-term uh, success is there for us the implant support of provisional restoration an article that I hope to have coming out in, in early 2008 is again a, a very strong interest of mine going back to 1999 uh, in working with, with the PROS department in San Antonio on really understanding the importance of a provisional restoration and to coin Frank Higginbottom the ability to create a, a guided soft tissue contouring process uh, in the healing stages of dental implantology. We're going to look at two different protocols for this. The one of the immediate provisionalization at the time of placement and that of a delayed or an early loading protocol where we'll take a surgical index create the provisional restoration outside of the mouth and deliver it uh, at uncovering. As the implant supported restoration transitions through periodontal tissues, it must support the established, that that we have established with augmentation procedures, both hard and soft tissues, or maintain tissue volumes, that that we've preserved through, uh, through our atraumatic surgical procedures. Uh, these maintained tissue volumes must be supported precisely to provide for a predictable aesthetic outcome uh, in cases like this where we've you know not just rebuilt enough bone for implant placement but we've recouped soft tissue contours and we'll, we'll look at that case in just a bit um, now as I said I'm gonna get started with uh, these case presentations from the standpoint of um, focusing on the provisional restoration I will point out which protocol we took in far as far as the loading and for instance in this case this is going to be uh, immediate non occlusal load so we will place a immediate provisionalization but it's going to be protected by the occlusion we set up so a uh, post extraction parapical x-ray uh, that did have a parapical pathosis still somewhat healing in like I said starting with a nice diagnostic wax up uh, this is pre my guidance area so the guidance I had was developed by the restorative dentist not by a three-dimensional image um, a nice surgical guide to guide me in the provisional restoration that's very simply uh, fabricated chair side as I go through some of these first cases I'm not going to be going through the step-by-step -step approach to create this uh, we'll get into that in more detail towards the end but this is nothing more than an acrylic provisional restoration that is delivered out of occlusion and left to heal. Now moving forward with a customized titanium abutment, uh, adjacent tooth is also prepared for full coverage restoration. 
Uh, and here we have the implant supporter restoration and the uh, adjacent full coverage crown. Meticulous uh, debridement of cement is a key to success, not just in the final restoration stage, but that's probably my one biggest complication uh, in why I'm going back to more screw retained provisionals is the retrieval of cement. When we're putting these under surgical flaps that need to heal, it can be a real, a, a real bugger as far as compromising our outcome and, and, and having to see patients uh, on, on emergency basis. So here we have our final result and one that with, with good planning, um, we're able to achieve an aesthetic result that, that, uh, that mimics a natural tooth uh, with full papilla and nice soft tissue contours. We're going to take a step back to my day in San Antonio and just show you the first case that I worked uh, up for a, uh, a provisional restoration. Um, this was more of a staged approach and you'll see why because the surgery was a, of a, more of an advanced protocol where we're going to be placing implants and grafting at the same time. Uh, and I'll just walk you through the steps of fabricating my surgical guide uh, of a hard acrylic rigid nature. Spa implant spacing, and you know, this may be a little bit different today than it, than it was at this point, uh, meaning we may try to even consider uh, narrowed, narrow, more narrow diameter fixtures to optimize the papilla, but this is pre, uh, we, we went into this case knowing that we did not expect to have a papilla between these two implants. So this is just the box out to allow for the fabrication of the, the heat cured acrylic stent, taking this to surgery where we're using our guide not only to direct our implant osteotomies but also making measurements from the proposed CEJ to where our initial inferior osteotomy is of the sinus procedure. Indexing, uh, indexing is just it's a great thing to, to do. I do it all the time even if the restorative doc has not requested it because uh, more times than not we end up using it to fabricate our provisional restoration. So this is closure. <coughs> patients in an interim partial denture while we allow this all to heal, integrate, and meanwhile we can go back to the laboratory and construct a very durable long-term provisional restoration. These are uh, the index setting our implant analogs in our model. Now we're selecting some temporary cylinder abutments and I've made a little black mark where we're going to cut those off and these are the screw retained provisional abutments that will use heat cured acrylic to fabricate our uh, provisional restoration. So here we have a, a screw retained uh, provisional that's going to be again very durable and is going to uh, stand the test of time in regards to how long we'd like to have this patient in a provisional restoration. And here we are at phase two uncovering and the delivery of this provisional restoration and some time later um, the healing uh, as I mentioned we're, we're really not aiming for papilla fill in this region uh, but just an example of where I got started with all of this, uh, of creating a provisional restoration that uh, is going to be utilized at, at stage two. Just as more of an aside here, uh, this is the implant supported provisional restoration here. This case is, is a more complex case of perio first then implant, then ortho. Uh, I'd never want to leave this out because it's truly a, a wonderful part of our practice is working with talented orthodontists to achieve tooth movement uh, and using implants as, as skeletal anchorage devices. Uh, you know, looking at the specific bicuspid site here, we're using a solid abutment uh, and we're then um, using a coping of some sort. This happens to be the, the Strawman coping where we are uh, snapping that onto the implant uh, trimming it with a, uh, any, any of your favorite burrs here, this happens to be a carbide, um, putting it back in and looking at our occlusal clearance and simply picking this up with a vacuform and acrylic. This can then be contoured on an implant analog to create good marginal adaptation using a finishing burr to come in and, and, and polish and refine our margins and delivers us into the mouth. Oftentimes with these copings, uh, I, I, if this was a surgical exposure day, I wouldn't use cement. I would snap it on and explain to the patient that it could come off. That's okay for the first seven to 10 days. If it comes off, come in and see me, I'll put it back on. I would like to try to avoid the cementation process. Uh, in developing our peri-implant sulcus, uh, mature tissue, and, and we need nice healthy tissue in a patient that's gonna get ready to go through long-term orthodontic care. And as you can see, 
when we progressed that this became much more than a single tooth implant provisional for aesthetic purposes. Uh, it became provisional restoration in each quadrant uh, implants used for, for skeletal anchorage. Uh, this one happened to be in an osteotome lift. This was in a lateral window lift. These two are used for distalization and uprighting of the second molars uh, and, and the case is proceeding along quite nicely. So another reason of where provisional restorations became a must. They, they need to be uh, utilized in this case to achieve the proper anchorage and ultimate tooth position, not just for the implants, but for, for the natural dentition. And these are the lower provisionals uh, about a year into orthodontic treatment. This again kind of brings me back to the initial days you'll see from the implant design that this, this case is, is, goes back a while, but I, I show this merely because the lateral incisor is probably the best candidate to consider uh, provisionalization uh, because of our ability to control the occlusion. Using a, a, a surgical guide, here's our implant placement following extraction with the horizontal defect that's filled in with a graft material. And in this case, a, a ginger hue abutment was used to immediately provisionalize uh, with a slight facial um, contour to it so we can keep that tooth truly out of occlusion. And then sometime later, uh, this is a PA of the provisional restoration in place. Uh, oftentimes you will, you will not see that you have marginal adaptation. It's not because you don't have it, it's because it's not radio opaque enough material. Uh, now I've gone to some materials that are truly uh, radio, radio opaque and, and you can see both the provisional margin adaptation uh, and using a radio opaque cement is important of course too to verify that you've debrided all the cement. And again, here we are sometime later uh, with, with good preservation of the interproximal bone tissue around this fixture. We'd all like to see cases like this where we, we're pretty confident that because of the thick periodontal biotype, we're going to be in good shape. But I'll just walk you through another example that really emphasizes once we've created these contours, how can we translate that into a final impression? So here we're again going for extraction and immediate implant placement with non-occlusal provisionalization. This is a day of extraction, implant placement, and temporary insertion. Sometime later with good soft tissue healing and, and preserving those soft tissues, uh, very common to see this very ulcerated peri-implant tissue, not uncommon that, that for it to bleed and, and be slightly uncomfortable when we disconnect. Uh, and here, the process of creating a customized impression coping. This is the provision restoration. So I've taken this off of the mouth. I've put a healing abutment on the implant while I do this chair side. Uh, this is nothing more than setting an analog uh, in quick set impression material, uh, like a blue mousse material, and then putting the, the provisional abutment and the provisional restoration um, and more blue mousse around that so we can pick up and register uh, the peri-implant profile that we've developed. Then an impression coping goes onto the analog and then something like Duralay or flowable composite is used that's alluded to the impression coping and delivered to the oral cavity. Um, this is two examples. There's our customized impression coping. Here is the provisional restoration set on an analog so we can come back. You know, oftentimes these, these provisionals will break down. A little bit of their marginal integrity will, will have been lost so we can simply reline it and polish it so that when we develop this, it's picking up the exact or the ideal contours, contours of our provisional restoration. And this is the customized impression coping interorally. Uh, we all know that we cannot inject material down uh, into that deep sulcus in the anterior zone with any type of predictability. Uh, it's not going to put the tissue at, at the dimension that, that we left it after the provisional is removed. So really the only true, true way to, to record that is with a customized impression coping. So we use this to go on to a customized abutment, uh, a non-precious metal abutment, and final restoration. This is very recently after cementation, and this is some time later uh, with good maintenance of the interproximal tissues and bone levels around this implant. Again, some time later. So we've been able to, to achieve good maintenance of our, our hard and soft tissues. Um, to what we'd expect given the implant design in this case. Here's a delayed placement, and, you, and again, we'll, we'll show you why, uh, a an early non-occlusal loading. And when we look at this patient situation, we not only have to replace a failing tooth, uh, 
uh, with it's a failed apicoectomy. You can see the old incision line from the apical surgery up here. Um, we've also got to close her diastema because that's a strong desire of hers to, to not only replace a failing tooth but to improve the smile uh, for this individual that has a relatively smile, smile, smile high, excuse me, high smile line um, and, uh, and a very large diastema. So a traumatic extraction, uh, you can see here that we do have a substantial uh, periapical granuloma uh, that is removed in a buccal uh, fenestration that we're going to repair after thorough debridement uh, using a collagen barrier down in that apical region. And then socket preservation, uh, in this case freeze-dry bone is used uh, and another uh, collar plug is used over the top of that. And I'll certainly show you many of these. Uh, not only do we all become proficient with making an implant supported provisional restoration, but we come profi become proficient with making the flipper uh, an ovate ponic design. Uh, I can't tell you, regardless of how many times we ask, uh, we very rarely get what we want. And this can simply be created within minutes, chair side, with a flowable composite or acrylic uh, by roughening the underneath surface. Uh, here we are prior to inserting it. Uh, we want this to apply good pressure into the the, the um, extraction site uh, and support that facial gingival margin as well as the papilla. Here we are at one week with good maintenance of the soft tissues, uh, still going through our healing phase, and a month later uh, getting ready for our um, implant placement with indexing for a stage two provisional. So here's our surgical index with what I would call more of a papilla sparing peekaboo incisions just to to get enough access to place our implant. I'd say today we're doing much more of a flapless approach than, than this, uh, but even back at this time, we were doing everything we could to do a minimally invasive procedure. This is after healing, so the patient had the implant placed and indexed, went back into the, to the ovate ponic design removable prosthesis, and from our surgical index, we used a preppable ginger hue abutment and fabricated an, an, an acrylic provisional uh, that mimics the, the tooth shape that we're trying to achieve, um, but we're still not quite to the standpoint of, of closing that diastema. But as you see, it'd be impossible for us to go through the provisional stage with the restorative dentist without taking into consideration that we've got to change the midline. So we've got to have a provisional on the implant before we can get to preparing that adjacent tooth. And this is just a, another example of, of a, uh, of a well-made laboratory fabricated provisional uh, that's going to be inserted uh, at uncovering. So we'll let this heal uh, and we'll come back now right prior to provisionalization or excuse, provisionalization of the natural teeth and, and do a little gingivplasty, uh, gingivectomy to, to get where we're headed. This is our final result and you know if anything, the criticism is that we probably need to do some crown lengthening instead of gingivectomy. You can see the facial gingival margin on nine has already crept back. And I've tried uh, to offer this to this patient at no cost many times and she won't, she won't let me touch her. So she's done and you know, considering where we started in regards to uh, you know, the whole smile design of the case and, and closing the diastema, she's quite happy. This is another question that comes up very often you, when we have to deal with canines, and especially canines and parafunction. You know, how, how slowly do we want to tread on these cases? In my opinion, uh, is unless it's just a rare case where the canines are, can be left out of occlusion, uh, we'll always stage these and still implement a provisional restoration for slowly progressively loading the implant. So slowly building that canine back into guidance uh, with a provisional restoration before we go to final. Uh, this is a case I won't show you the final on, but I'll show you at the, to the provisional state. I mean, a very deep bite. This patient's an orthodontic patient, really, uh, but he's, he's going to lose his canine. Uh, the ex that reddish hue, uh, is, we know we're in trouble, and as you can see, the resorptive lesion was, was, was incredible. Um, completely had undermined the entire crown. So here we're doing our surgical index. Uh, implant placement with just a cover screw and, and grafting the horizontal defect around this implant using our trusty ovate ponic design provisional restoration to support facial tissues and interproximal tissues and coming back with a biopsy punch technique to expose our implant and connect a uh, screw retained provisional restoration that's properly contoured uh, in, in centric we, we are you know putting a little bit of 
occlusion on this, but trying to limit it in excursions, as we'll see uh, in just a moment here. You can see the screw access will just fill in with a cotton pellet and some cabot material or IRM, whatever your preference is. Uh, and here we are, day of, of delivery of a provisional. Uh, this is some time later showing that as we go into excursions, we've, we've left the canine out, out of complete function there. And the patient is happy and, and soon will be moved towards his final restoration. Now another example of a case where we want to consider all the different options here. Um, you know, we've, we've got a hard and soft tissue defect to deal with. Uh, root resorption once again, uh, significant root resorption. Uh, and, and this, in my mind, is not a case where we want to immediately provisionalize an implant. We've got too much tissue to rebuild, but we will. Uh, here's a facial profile showing the facial deficiency uh, of soft tissues that uh, we need to recoup. Our diagnostic wax up that becomes the key portion of uh, the roadmap towards success. Here's our uh, analysis of the extraction defect and implant preparation for immediate placement. Um, and our horizontal defect that is, that is grafted and trying to limit it to uh, approximately two millimeters um, by our planned uh, implant diameter size, our surgical index that's taken, the grafting of the horizontal defect, slight cr clinical crown lengthening on the adjacent central incisor, a connective tissue, subepithelial connective tissue graft is harvested to an attempt to do our first soft tissue rebuilding of the case, and a little collagen, quickly resorbing collagen material to, to help dress that wound. And then our ovate ponic design interim partial denture is utilized to support tissues at a week. Uh, we're looking at the collagen material there um, and at a month we're, we're happy that we've maintained the, uh, the connective tissue graft and have a good uh, start here at rebuilding the, the loss of soft tissue. And another picture of our chair side modified uh, ovate ponic there, uh, very simply done with some flowable composite. Uh, here we are getting ready for stage two. Uh, we've done a good job at, at rebuilding some of that soft tissue, but you can see on an occlusal view there is a, still a depression that we're going to correct at uh, provisional insertion. This little peekaboo flap uh, to allow to get this abutment down uh, without uh, tissue impingement or tissue preventing us from getting it down all the way, and then the provisional restoration properly contoured. Then we'll take a, our second subepithelial connective tissue graft, uh, and just to show you the size of it, and then kind of tunnel this laterally to try to rebuild. Uh, early on in healing here, uh, we see that we, we still have some clefting that we want to come back in plasty, uh, and we are also going to be uh, placing a restoration on the adjacent tooth, fortunate enough to do this case with my wife, so she's a restorative doctor here, uh, prepping the adjacent tooth for, for, for a veneer restoration. And, and again, another example like the diastema closure where we couldn't do this without a provisional on the implant. We need to have developed the contours of the tissue before we move on to this step of final impressions. So here, the, the case I showed at the beginning of how, how well we've re-established the facial soft tissue profile and how we've created the emergence profile from the implant platform. We're going to go through the same process of creating a customized impression coping. So this is the abutment that's in the mouth put on an analog. You can see here how we've lost some of the marginal integrity. Simply reline that with a flowable composite and polish. Here's our provisional relined and, and, and improved the contours of it. Uh, here's our impression coping placed on the analog and our blue mousse material around that uh, recording the, the, the shape of our provisional restoration. This is the customized impression coping and I'll just put a little, take a, a, a sharpie and mark the facial aspect of that just for ease and you know, delivering it to the oral cavity to line it up correctly. Depending on the system, uh, it may not be as important. But this, with this implant system, we've got a three-prong index, so to say, and we want to make sure when we put this into the mouth that we've got it in the right position, right orientation. So here's our impression. Uh, we're, again, we're pre impressing both the implant and the adjacent veneer preparation and moving forward to the laboratory process. I'll share this laboratory process because this is one of the most talented tech technicians that I've worked with uh, in regards to creating a portion infused to metal abutment. Um, going back to his wax up, showing in the anterior zone how difficult it would be to, to consider an a implant design that, a, that has us cement a restoration near the implant platform. 
we're looking at close to six, seven millimeters and approximately, uh, that's quite deep. So we need to be thinking more and more about customization into anterior zone so that we can uh, have retrieval ability of the cement. Here's the cutback of the, the, the metal abutment and then the porcelain addition. Um, here's our, on the model, looking at the, where he's setting us up for a very, very, very accessible restorative margin. And here's our adjacent veneer, porcelain fused to metal abutment, and porcelain fused to metal crown. Another example of it on an analog or a practice implant there, uh, in side profile, uh, just a very nice job at, at creating a, a well-contoured restoration that mimics what our provisional did for us. And to the day of seeding. Um, still got a little clefting over here that will ultimately come back in plasti. As this case goes forward, uh, we'll look here first uh, at our, where we started, uh, short clinical crowns on the central, so we have some freedom to come in and do that crown lengthening on the adjacent tooth. Here's at the provisional stage, where we haven't prepped the natural tooth, but we've gained some clinical crown length, and we still have healing around the distal aspect of the implant restoration. Now we're on to our final restoration, and with time, this is going to, uh, start to look better and better as far when the tissues start to mature uh, and that cleft uh, is reduced um, but we're certainly comfortable with the amount of tissue we've regenerated there so that we can have a long-term uh, predictable result uh, showing good maintenance of bone levels you'll see on most of these immediate implant placement case cases that they're placed rather deep uh, and that i think is one drawback of immediate implant placement into extraction sites we tend to protect ourselves by going a little bit deeper uh, and, and certainly in cases like that, you need to be thinking about how you're going to transition getting the cement line up to a, 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 an accessible position. And here our patient is uh, today. Another canine case, and for the same reasons, in this case we're going to stage the implant provisionalization. We can see that we not only have a, uh, to recoup a, a tooth here, we, we've got a recoup the soft tissue profile or the canine eminence that we will plan into this case at the time of, uh, of implant placement. So first implant placement using some osteotomes to expand the ridge. <coughs> implant placement. Here's a second guide that the prosthodontist has made me to verify the position. I believe we'll have a measurement picture coming up. Here's implant placement. Here it is. This is the second guide that he's made to tell me that he'd like this proposed CEJ to be three millimeters from the implant um, restorative margin. Our indexing performed, our connective tissue ridge augmentation conducted, and still using the removable appliance uh, to work these tissues. And now is the time we'll be working back in the laboratory to create a screw retained provisional restoration. And upon implant uncovering, that picture shows nicely our ability to reform the canine eminence area with just soft tissues. Uh, see a very nice result of what our osteotomes did for us to, to build up the dimension of buckle bone. Our screw retained provisional restoration to give us a nice tight seal with no cement issues. Currently advancing the flap, uh, probably beyond where we need to, uh, but certainly uh, even if we have to come back and over contour the restoration, the provisional, to get that tissue to move apically, I'd rather start with it uh, further coronally than, than, than not enough. And here we are in the provisional stage, allowing tissues to mature and heal. You can see again that we want, we, we want this to ultimately go a little bit further apically, but this is a nice problem to have at this juncture. We still got some maturation to occur uh, in the papillary areas. And moving on with a different, different technique for this prosthodontist, but it's still a customized impression coping here. He's just used Duralay versus a flowable material to create a customized impression coping and pick up these contours uh, and, and develop, transfer those to a master cast. Uh, here we're going with uh, a, a porcelain infused to metal abutment with a porcelain infused to metal crown. Uh, a veneer for the lateral incisor and a mesial MO inlay for the bicuspid. And here we are uh, very shortly after seeding, still waiting on some papillary fill. 
and we're moving along to a standpoint where we're much more happy with how the tissue's maturing uh, and, and the tissue has receded a bit um, and we're really not going to do anything with that. We'll just let it be where it's at and, and probably have some subsequent recession there. But canines are, are, are cases really to think towards a delayed approach, but still using a provisional restoration to progressively load these implants and be really comfortable with their integration status before we move forward. Next case is going to look at uh, a real old example of, of ceramic abutments. Uh, and this case goes back quite some time. Uh, challenging case of root resorption where we've lost some of the attachment on the lateral incisor. Uh, unfortunately, we get this case after extraction. So we, we get a case at this standpoint where we've lost all papilla. Uh, and this patient has made it very clear that she will do whatever it takes. She'll spend as long as she needs to get the optimal outcome. So we'll do some things in this case that I would not say are highly predictable or routine, but it's a good example of me being very lucky uh, as we transition through this case. So we had to go back, and this does date the case, so I don't use much GTAM anymore, but this is a, a ridge augmentation procedure using Gore-Tex membrane and autogenous bone. Here's moving right to stage two therapy, uh, working hand in hand with a prosthodontist that's right there and has their lab. So we'll see an impression coping and take an index um, where we're using a rigid surgical guide to loot with Durale the impression coping to the guide. She goes back to the lab while I'm working on a connective tissue graft and starts to create the provisional restoration uh, that is delivered that same day. So here's our pressed ceramic, the old style ceramic abutment or first generation ceramic abutment and provisional restoration. Our connective tissue grafting uh, and these procedures that follow just could not be done without a provisional restoration. So we'll, we'll let it heal a little bit, but we're still quite deficient on the papilla. Uh, but we have the ability to take this provisional off and work in approximately, uh, have the access to, to move tissue around. Um, we're just still deficient. It's hard to see on this picture, but there's, there's still significant gaps in approximately. And this is where, uh, you know, what I'm going to show you next is not something that's routine. Uh, papilla reconstruction, kind of using the, uh, the technique of a, a palatal roll technique, but not for a ridge augmentation, for papillary augmentation. So a papilla reconstruction, reconstruction where we're just moving connective tissue from the palate into the improximal zone, putting our provisional restoration back on, and we just were fortunate in this case to gain some papilla height. Now we're moving forward to final soft tissue recontouring. Uh, today I would use probably a laser to recontour the tissue. Uh, in this case I'm using a large diamond burr to recontour our soft tissues. Here are, here's our final restoration shortly after insertion. Uh, and the benefits of, of cases like this are that even though it's not perfect, uh, it's, it's a pretty favorable change from where we started and it's one of those cases that really gets better with time uh, and somewhat violates what we've been taught about the position of inter interproximal bone. As you'll see here on, an interpro on a seven-year x-ray, we've got maintenance of bone to the first thread on the mesial but not the distal. The distal's uh, just beyond the first thread and because of our contact position, I'm not sh so sure how well that shows up on your view, but we've moved that contact position apically to help us maintain the tissues uh, that, that, are, that are good for this patient. She's, she's certainly a happy uh, long-term long -term result there. And here, another case where we have a hard and soft tissue deficiency. Uh, I was not involved in the implant therapy, just in the provisional stage of this case. So the implant was placed prior to me becoming involved. Uh, we can see that we have uh, good hard tissue three-dimensionally here uh, for the implant surgeon, uh, but a significant soft tissue deficiency that we need to mask with a soft tissue graft. In profile, significant ridge deficiency here. Here's the index. This, so now this here's where I'm coming into uh, helping with the case. Index is used to prepare our provisional restoration. So we not only need to get a tooth in here, but we've got to recoup this. And you can see after provisional and buccal connective tissue grafting, we've reestablished that facial tissue. Here you can see it in, um, 
just showing that it's a cement retained provisional restoration that's quite durable in these folks that have heavy occlusal wear uh, I, I like to go to a, a screw retained more durable restoration save us time in the repair phase of fractures and just a really nice result of how we've used the provisional still to, to reestablish that facial gingival margin and facial soft tissue profile this patient moved on to the uh, I guess I would call the second generation ceramic abutments or the zir first zirconium abutment. Uh, there's a real post um, and most of the restorative docks will, will put these in with temporary cement. Uh, in this case it was nice for me because it came off at about three years and I get a good chance to, to, to really assess the soft tissue profiles developed with the final restoration. Um, you can see that we did some root, we subsequently did some root covered uh, on this tooth to even the gingival margins. Um, and my only criticism here is that, you know, today um, we do everything we can to move this implant more coronally. Uh, if you remember the initial PA, uh, we had facial bone up here. So we placed this implant rather deep and over time uh, we've, got a, we've got a, you know, a kind of a violation of crown to root ratio, uh, but with a long-term um, functional outcome here, we, we feel we're safe. And I've just got a few more minutes, and if, if it's okay, uh, Harold, because we start about five minutes late, we'll press on for an extra five. This case uh, has a really interesting history and documentation. In 96, the patient fell off a horse, and no fracture was visualized, but as we go through to 2001, even going through orthodontic therapy in this time period, we start to see the fracture on the root, uh, and it was bonded the, the day of the, the incident, the, the coronal, coronal fracture was bonded uh, and we were just going to, the restorative doctor was going to um, watch it closely. This was when I became involved in, in 2002. We've got a young lady uh, pressing to get off to college uh, we, and her parents have emphasized that they want to do things as quick as possible. So with the three-dimensional analysis, cross-sectional view, I uh, want to point out that we've because of that com cosmetic bonding, we've already got a pre-plan for the fact that this is over contoured, and if we're going to end up with a, the state, the straight emergence of the natural tooth, then we've got to do one of two things: change the shape of the natural tooth, or rebuild some soft tissues in approximately on the distal of the proposed implant. Using some model surgery to give me the ability to create a provisional restoration for the time of implant placement and provisionalization. Here we're removing our tooth. Uh, pretty dramatic fracture there that we now can see uh, full right. Here's our provisional uh, left out of occlusion. Uh, not the most pretty provisional restoration, but it's going to do us do our job for us in the first weeks of healing. Here we can see at one week we've got good healthy tissue. I've left the interproximal zones open, and then at about six to eight weeks we've come back and made a, a new provisional. Uh, that's highly polished and well contoured and more aesthetic for this young lady. Here we can see that the ability to really create a nice marginal integrity of our provisional onto the abutment uh, and this has worked with the tissue for another six to eight weeks. Uh, in this case we went towards a final restoration more early than I would have ordinarily been comfortable with uh, but we're going to plan to leave some some space there for papillas to fill over time. So same process that you've seen before, creating the customized impression coping, first relining the temporary that's been kind of beat up and creating the, the, the best marginal adaptation we can uh, to create a customized impression coping. And again, same process, the abutment that's in the mouth, the provisional that's in the mouth, and then using this same protocol to make a customized impression coping and final impression. Here we're just taking shades here and using the technology at the other end of it to custom mill a Procera abutment. And here early on in the stage we've still got some papilla to fill uh, but with time because of our planning and, and appropriate placement uh, we're gonna we're gonna feel confident and comfortable that this is going to fill uh, as it is at this stage in this stage. Nice soft tissue health around the implant supported restoration uh, and she continues to over the years has continued to look really better and better with time. Highly scalloped periodontium 
Uh, so we're, we're happy that we could preserve that tissue in one of a, kind of a more challenging case. Uh, nice maintenance of, of bone around our fixture. Now, kind of jumping ahead to two cases, and then I will be done in another few minutes uh, of kind of just different philosophies here of taking out a tooth and placing an immediate implant. There's the horizontal fracture of our central. Uh, a traumatic uh, extraction as, as much as possible, verifying that we've got the platform three millimeters apical to the facial gingival margin, our indexing. And what we're going to do in this case is we're going to deliver the, the, the ovate ponic removable and go back to the laboratory so this is one week uh, after implant placement. Go back to the laboratory and, and create the final abutment with a provisional restoration. So we're going to come back and at stage two, deliver a zirconium abutment with a provisional restoration and see how we can do as far as maintaining tissues. You saw that the healing abutment had exposed itself, so we have a relatively straightforward abutment connection, blanching the tissue slightly. And this patient's one of those guys that he didn't understand why he needed a final restoration. He was very happy with the provisional. We can see some time later, eight weeks later, that the contours are, are, are nice. Uh, we've got thin tissue, so in retrospect on this case, as we'll see with the final restoration at three years, uh, I probably should have done a connective tissue uh, procedure at the time of implant placement, just a little tunnel approach, because uh, we'd lost about a half a millimeter on the facial, pro facial profile. Um, the complicating thing with this is that the dentist has got to take a direct impression. And unless you're working with someone that's going to be really careful with this, they can, they can play a role in that facial recession of tissue. And here I think we have our final case. This is a, a great No, there's two more. Here, here's a case that, again, looks at going to a final restoration. A college child that the parents are pressing things quickly and because of a congenitally missing tooth we've got extra tissue uh, that we can fortunately uh, help us out along this way of, of delivering um, a final restoration at the time of, of uncovering. Okay, so this is not something that we routinely do either, but a good example of where we were fortunate enough to, uh, to have enough tissue to work with in this regard. So the, the implant's placed at the appropriate chronoapical dimension, and we've got buccal bone that we needed to profile. Uh, so we want this, you know, the bone is even up close to the CEJ on our natural teeth. So we're going to apically position the implant and profile it uh, so that we can have a restoration emerge through both the hard and soft tissues in this case. Here's our, our natural tooth that's bonded to adjacent, and here's at phase two. From my surgical index, the restorative dentist has selected an abutment and created the final porcelain fused metal crown. And we just happen to be fortunate at six weeks, we've got pretty good uh, gingival heights on the, on the implant restoration that, that is, um, puts it into perspective with the contralateral lateral incisor. And some time later, uh, we've got good soft tissue maturation and an aesthetic result um, in, in a pretty pretty unique situation where we're delivering a final restoration at the time of implant uncovering. And the last case, uh, periortho. I mentioned this at the beginning. This is a huge part of enabling us to do things better. We've got congenitally missing laterals that the orthodontist has done a wonderful job in creating adequate space. We have get our three-dimensional analysis in this case. It's going to tell us in cross-section to expect buccal fenestration. So we're going to be prepared to do some grafting at the time of implant placement. Here's our surgical guide directing us appropriately and our expected fenestrations that are grafted with a resorbable membrane and freeze-dried bone. Our surgical indexes that are the key to making our provisional restorations, uh, our master cast to create our provisional restorations, and my very talented uh, Andrew Canterbury making provisionals. These are custom provisionals that uh, uh, not anybody can make. I mean, he does a wonderful job at using an inexpensive cylinder abutment and looting the emergence profile to the abutment and then having a cement retained provisional that's right at the gingival margin. So here we are at the day of implant uncovering. Uh, you can see before seating and then true seating of the restoration on the abutment, letting the tissues heal. Uh, and you do remember that this case started with no papilla. There's just a flat uh, profile of tissue uh, where those congenitally missing incisors are. Uh, again, healing around our pr provisional restorations, 
Uh, that's an occlusal view of the provisional restoration that's very uh, accessible to get cement out. And we're going to be moving forward with our final impression that will allow us to create Procera abutments and all ceramic crowns for numbers 7 and 10. Here's the day of seeding. Looks good on 7. We beat up number 10 pretty good. But as time goes on, this young 19-year-old female, uh, still same day of seeding. Here's a before and after of the seeding day. And here's some time later where we're really happy with what this young individual uh, is going to take with her through life um, with, with good maintenance of hard and soft tissues around these two implants. Uh, and without the orthodontist, uh, we would have been nowhere. So a dramatic uh, before to after. And over two years of, of post-loading success. So I'm going to skip forward. This is, I had hoped to touch on a bit of research that we're getting started on immediate provisionalization uh, in the aesthetic zone. Um, we're going to have to skip through that and just move to some conclusions here. I hope I haven't confused you in this process, but it's certainly for someone that's getting started with provisionalization, uh, it, it is a journey that, that's taken me close to a decade to really feel comfortable with the different techniques that are available to us and they continue to evolve. Uh, but it all starts with good treatment planning with a restorative dentist in a quality laboratory using computer aided technology, uh, advanced material technology to augment tissues both hard and soft and keeping up with the evolution of provisionalization uh, and implant design and an abutment design. A specific attention to the occlusion, that's a key in this, both to the success of the provisional and being durable enough to withstand the occlusal load. Um, what the research was planned to touch on a little bit, but I think depending whether an implant is stable enough, uh, we just don't, Homley Wang's recent patient, we just, recent paper in Jomi, we just don't have a good way of assessing implant stability. Uh, the ways we have need to be looked at more. So RFA, uh, the resonance frequency analysis, um, we're starting to use now to look at this. Um, indexing should be a routine in your practice, uh, creating emergence profile abutment and provisional, well contoured and highly polished, uh, and I can't emphasize enough the good lab support. I thank you for your time. I apologize for the rush because we got a late start, um, but I will entertain any questions as we finish today.